Little ones can be dismissed to children's ministry. You have a handout coming around. If you need something to write with, let this young man know, and he will be more than glad to get it for you. We are continuing this morning with our uh, series, Connecting Church and a Culture of Evangelism. And this week, our our thoughts are going to be on our, our gospel worldview, the centrality of the gospel. Um, is the gospel the center of our worldview? And it's interesting, we're, we're living in a culture right now, we're living in a period of history in the United States where uh, that worldview is being challenged. Um, at one time, um, the United States was looked at as a, as a country that, that by and large had a worldview of Christianity or the gospel. Uh, it was President Adams said that uh, the Constitution was for a religious people and would not work for any other. And uh, we're going to, uh, we're seeing that kind of played out. And there's a, there's a pushback. And we're in the middle of a, a chaotic time here in America. But uh, within our church, we need to have that centrality of the gospel. And if we're going to be a, a church that has a culture of evangelism, it's important that we keep the gospel center stage. So, with that, liberty must treat the gospel as a way of life. Having that in the center of what we do is crucial if we're going to cultivate a culture of evangelism. And remember what our definition of evangelism is, it's, it's to teach the gospel with the aim to persuade. And preaching is nothing other than than a type of anointed teaching that our, our main course that we want to serve up is what Christ told us to go out and make converts and to let them know everything that, that Christ had said, everything that he had done, uh, point them to the cross, show them that there is a, a mediator, that they do not have to leave this life totally separated from the Father. But God had made a way, he had made a provision for mankind to go and be home with God for all of eternity. Now, we have a, right, right out of the gate, the church had a situation. And um, Paul, he was kind of like the newbie. He just arrived on the scene. And when the lowly freshman apostle Paul rebuked the sinner, the senior, and, and this senior was a pillar of the church, and his name was Apostle Peter. I would think that it probably took some gumption for him to do that. Uh, if you get a chance to read Galatians 2, 11 through 14, Peter, after all, he had walked with Jesus for three years in Palestine. He had preached the message of grace in the, chap in the book of Acts that opened the doors of the first church. He had stared down the Sanhedrin, the very court that had put Christ to death just a mere weeks before. But in Galatians, Paul tells us that fear of man caused Peter to stumble, caused Peter to make a mistake, to want to revert back to his uh, uh, Jewish culture. And what Peter was doing, he was slipping into the law and forgetting that the grace of God had been extended to everybody, including those that were not Jews. And the first issue 
if, if, you, if you just look at the first glance, it was the dinner table. But Paul saw the deeper meaning. Peter's actions were at odds with justification by grace alone. There's no other way where you and I can be justified outside of grace, outside of the, the blood that was shed at Calvary that brought a reconciliation between us and the Father. Now, this account in Galatians is important in helping Christians understand the grace of God for us in Christ. Paul even says in Galatians 2.5 that this family fight between Peter and him, it preserved the gospel. It preserved the gospel. Now, here it says in Galatians, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Now, he's talking about yielding in submission to the apostle Peter and what Peter was talking about at first glance, like I said, was the food. And then he wanted to bring in the, uh, the act of circumcision uh, that the Gentiles had to be circumcised according to the law. And Peter and, and Paul said to them, to, to them, those that was trying to bring this alongside grace, we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So Paul uses a phrase here that's, that's extremely helpful for understanding how we keep our lives gospel-focused. We keep our lives gospel-centered. Paul says, Peter's conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. This was important to Paul. He, he wasn't going to just say, well, okay, this will pass. I can get along with this. I don't want to cause a big ruckus here. No, his conduct was not in step with the gospel. This small phrase opens an entirely new outlook for us about the gospel. It tells us the gospel is not only a message of salvation, but the gospel is a way of life. And sometimes we need to challenge ourselves, do I live my life according to the gospel rudiments? Is my way of life central to the gospel? How I speak, what I choose to listen to, who I choose to have in my inner circle? Is the gospel central in me conveying a message of warning to those that don't know Jesus? I found that as we live out the gospel, sharing the gospel is much more a part of our lives. However, living out the gospel is not the same as moral living. There's a lot of folks that live morally, but they're not living according to the gospel. There's a difference. Now, I will say that if you live according to the gospel, your life will be moral. But you can live a moral life and not be living according to the gospel. They look similar on the surface, and perhaps that's why even the apostle Peter could be confused. He thought, well, some of this Jewish custom is good. I think we need to bring this in. We need to kind of uh, mix this a little bit. And so he, he thought this might be best. Trying to live a moral life is impossible. Living a gospel life is a gift from God. And I'm thankful for the gift of the gospel. I'm thankful that it's not anything that we cannot live, we cannot sustain, we cannot exemplify by God's grace. Now, how to live out the gospel? How, how's, that, how's that come about? Saying that we should live out the gospel and knowing how that works are two different things. But fortunately, the Bible tells us how to do it. The New Testament often takes a gospel theme and applies it to our life. Here's Paul. He preaches the gospel. 
Then he talks about the implications of the gospel in our lives. Now, an implication is not the gospel message itself, but something that flows from the gospel. It, it, it comes from the gospel. It's, it's how we live. It's how we walk. It's how we talk. It's how we do things. For instance, Paul tells us that our forgiveness for one another is tied to the gospel. Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So Paul doesn't just hang that out there and says, you ought to forgive one another. He doesn't just leave that by itself. But he, he implies that for us to forgive one another, he implies it from Christ. As Christ has forgiven us, then we ought to forgive one another. Our way of life is tied to the gospel. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. Sometimes we just need to challenge ourselves with that statement. Is my way of life worthy of the gospel? How I convey uh, my love or my respect or my attitude towards my husband or towards my wife? How I raise my children? Do I, do I teach them Bible verses? Uh, and some of us as, as grandparents, do we, do we work with our grandchildren and, 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 and teaching them to memorize certain biblical passages? Our way of life is tied to the gospel. So we ought to let our manner be worthy of that. Even how we work in positions of authority is directly linked with the gospel. In the book of Matthew, this is what Christ says. He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So even within positions of authority, we should link that to the gospel. Like I said earlier, that the Constitution of the United States, of this republic, was based on the fact that we would serve one another. That the people would be served by the government, of the people, for the people, by the people. And it's worth it's worth pushing back for. We have a tremendous opportunity to be the light of the world, and it's only because of the grace of God that we can do this. So Christ talks here about how we ought to rule, how we ought to be in charge of one another, it, and it, it talks about we do that as a slave. We do that as a, as a bondservant, one to another. So, for Christians, how we forgive how we live our lives, how we work and how we lead, and really everything about our lives should be rooted in the gospel. Do we live our lives that way? Do we live to please others other than ourselves? Do we serve? Do we become that slave? Are there implications because of the gospel that we feel we must live by as Christians? You might say, well, what does this have to do with the culture of evangelism? Well, <laughs> everything. It has everything to do with it. 
Understanding the gospel as a way of life means making sure our lives align with the gospel in every part. And I want to challenge you with that. If I don't challenge you with with encouraging you to align your life with the gospel in all parts of, 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 of your entity, you're, you're speaking, you're, you're conveying your, um, your relationships, even your thoughts. Are your thoughts being brought captive to Christ according to the gospel? You might say, well, I'm sure glad I didn't say what I was thinking. Well, it would be better if you could just get to the place where you wouldn't think it. And we do sometimes. We, we think some terrible thoughts. We think some ugly thoughts. Sometimes we think unholy thoughts. Do we bring them in alignment with the gospel? Now, if we work at this, you, you're not going to be perfect. You can be more mature as you grow going forward. But we have a, uh, a nature that, um, because of the nature, we're, we're going to die. There, there's part of us that just, it just uh, we're more like the creature than we are the creator most of the time. But if we really work at aligning ourselves with the gospel... This will help the gospel come out of us, whether we are with believers or whether we are with non-believers. It's easy to talk with uh, Brother Doug or Brother Bob, Brother Daryl, Brother Rick, uh, Brother Daniel. It's easy. I could go with Sister Donna, Sister Connie, and Sister Julie. Uh, but it's easy to talk the gospel to you guys because we, we have that as a commonality. We we, we, as a matter of fact, we bask in that. But how are we in talking that same gospel, that same encouraging word, to those that are not believers? Aligning ourselves with the gospel in every way will help us to share the gospel with unbelievers as well as with believers. If we live gospel-centered lives, we will find ourselves sharing the gospel. If our fellowship knows how to apply the gospel in all of life, then this fellowship, known as liberty, will explode with gospel-centered evangelism. You sharing your story your testimony with those that come across your path. If you only feel, uh, as the old saying goes, if you only feel froggy uh, to jump with the gospel when you're in church, then there's something wrong. We need to feel froggy to jump with the gospel out in the mission field, and that's beyond those doors. We want to explode with gospel-centered evangelism. We want you to invite your friends that aren't Christians to church. We want them to feel welcomed as they observe Christianity in action when it comes to worship, when it comes to preaching. It's not to make them feel comfortable that everything's all right with their, their lives if they're sinners, I don't want you as Christians to feel all right with your lives because there's areas in our life we need to be challenged. And I believe messages ought to bring conviction. And if there's sinners here, it ought to bring condemnation. So we want to invite folks to church. Like I said, if we we know how to apply the gospel in our life, in our thinking, in our communicating, in our doing, uh, in in all aspects of it, if we align with that, then uh, the gospel-centered evangelism will explode out of this small assembly. Next thing we need to do is kill our assumptions. Assumptions can get you in a lot of trouble. 
And I'm saying that as clearly and bluntly as I know how. Kill your assumptions. And what I'm talking about is, is this. Is when, when the gospel is assumed, we begin to think that everyone who shows up at church is a Christian. Uh, we just think they are. They're, they're at church. However unlikely that may be, many people in churches behave if that's true. That bad assumption leads to the next. There is no need to share, teach, or preach the gospel. Everybody's saved. Everybody's going to heaven. And you see this played out in funerals. You go to a funeral and you know that person really was not a believer unless there was something happened in private before they died. But you get around the family and it's like, well, at least he's at peace. At least she's with the angels. At least we'll see him again. You're whistling, you're whistling in the dark past the graveyard. If you want to go to a place where you can have fellowship and be seen again, you need to be born again. If you're not born again, hell will be your home. Even though there may be a lot of people in that terrible place, you will be one of the loneliest people in all of creation. There will be no parties. There will be no high-fiving. There will be, no, there'll, there'll be no looking at the other person. You won't see anybody. It will be the blackest of black the darkest of dark, the loneliest of lonely places. You may f- hear the screams, you may feel the heat in the abyss of hell, but it will be a lonely place. It's terrible when I hear people say that as a comfort one to another that they'll see their departed ones again in heaven and they've got their wings and they're with the angels. Why do they believe that? Perhaps it's because the church has failed in presenting the gospel. We don't want to assume that everybody's all right when they pass away because that's just not the case. Over time, confusion about the gospel grows. External actions are confused with genuine Christian belief, Christian faith. Morality becomes an expectation and not a response of love. The cross is treated merely as an example, not the place where God's wrath and love very uniquely meet. Eventually, the gospel is lost altogether. And I'm afraid that we are seeing that exemplified in places that have church names above their door. You would think a a name like the United Church of Christ would be a wonderful place to go. They affirm sexual immorality. They have members who have no relationship with Christ at all. They have folks involved with their services that are, that are completely, completely off the mark when it comes to um, living a life that's worthy of the gospel. We're living in turbulent times within these United States. And I believe this is a travesty in the Christian community. It's why Paul instructed Timothy to guard the gospel. To guard the gospel. And to pass it on with care. He knew the gospel could be lost. And this is what he said. He says, Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. 
guard the gospel? Do you guard the gospel? Are you vocal about defending the gospel? Do you speak up when you see errancy and say, no, what do you mean? That's not the Bible. Here's what the Bible has to say. You're wrong. You, you need to be warmed to flee the wrath to come. You're heading to hell. Now I'm talking about defending the gospel to others that claim Christianity, but they're not presenting the gospel. The name over the door might sound religious, and they may have a form of religion. But I'm telling you, there's going to be a lot of folks with a form of religion that went to churches that had Jesus across the door. They're not going to make it to heaven. Hell will be their eternal home. Because somebody in that group of people, over the course of time, did not guard the gospel. When I was a kid, there was a group that came down to Dean Road called Earl and the Whiteheads. I know it's a strange name for a gospel group. But they had a song that they sang about the sheep and the goats. And they, they said the sheep are kind of particular on what they chew, but the goats, just any old thing will do. We've let down the bars and the sheep ran out, and that's how the goats got in. And today, that's almost looking back at it, it's almost like a prophetic song. The goats have got in and the sheep have ran out in a lot of churches here in America. So Paul is telling Timothy, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me. Don't let your assumptions kill your community witness. We want to slay those assumptions. If you find yourself being bored with the gospel, then perhaps we need to take a deep look at the sin in our own hearts. More seriously, if the gospel does not resonate in your heart, check and see that you've been truly converted. There are folks that think they've been saved, and they're not saved at all. We, we go through certain things within the counseling ministry. Somebody comes in, they say they're Christian, well, so, well let's, just, uh, let's just cover some areas here and let's, let's see if you are. Let's see where you're at. Maybe you thought you were and you're not. Or maybe you thought you are and you're way out here someplace, at, at the very least you need to be, uh, you need to be recommitting your faith at, at the very worst. Or at the very least, the very worst is you may not have ever been saved at all. So we don't want to assume that everybody that we come in contact with or everybody that comes to this church is a Christian. They may not be. There's always going to be people in our churches, even small churches, who may look like believers. Which I believe it's so important that we keep sharing the gospel. Because it challenges them. So, oh, well, okay, maybe I need to talk with the Lord about this. As I said, there, there's pretenders to the faith. Some of them may be pretending because they don't know any better, and some may be pretending just because it's just what they do. I've heard of folks going to large churches in our area because they, they're involved with certain things, like they sell insurance. So, well, you know... I'd like to come out to Liberty, but there's only just a few families. Who's going to buy insurance from me? But if you go to church where there's two or 3,000 people and you've got connections, people like good, honest people, so they go there. They may not have a relationship with Christ. They may be good moral people, but are they pretenders? There's many pretenders to the faith. There's many more who have been falsely assured that they are Christians because of how they were raised, because they were involved in the church, or because they had high moral standards. We must stop assuming that everyone at our Christian gatherings is a Christian. 
assume that non-Christians are there. You might ask, well, what about our children? What about our grandchildren? There's numerous children that pray sinner's prayer when they're very young. Maybe they're off the camp. Maybe it's in a youth group, and they're coached through a, a sinner's prayer. I've, I've been a Christian long enough From my times at, at Dean Road, at Shelby Free Will Baptist Church, and here, um, that I've cried with many parents whose adult children are now far from the faith, even though they acted like Christians when they were growing up. It's true, it's a sad fact, but it's, it's very, very true. So what I want to encourage you to do with your children and your grandchildren, even if they're adults, keep talking to your children about the gospel, both at home and at church. Reaffirm, re-encourage. Speak verses into their hearts and into their minds uh, that they need to align their lives. The centrality of the gospel evangelism, is it, is it, exemplified in their walk. Keep talking to your children about the gospel. Guard the good deposits entrusted to you. What Paul was telling Timothy. And we need to do the same thing. We need to encourage our children, encourage our grandchildren, encourage one another to guard the gospel. A few verses later, picking up some of the same language he tells Timothy as part of his guarding, to entrust to faithful men, entrust to faithful people. What has been entrusted to him? And part of that entrusting is teaching them to pass the same thing on to others, teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade. That's what Paul's telling me. That's what evangelism is. It's your job to evangelize those people that are in your circle. I may never meet them. I may never be on the job with good old buddy Bob, good old buddy Bill, uh, good old friend down the road, Janie. You know, I, I, I may never see them. But your job in evangelism is to teach the gospel with the aim to persuade them to flee the wrath to come. There's a wrath coming. There's going to come a day, just as the Bible says, there's going to be a a tune played, the the eastern skies are going to be split, and there's going to be some happenings. And some of those happenings are going to be hallelujah chorus for those that have, have died in Christ. But it's going to be terrible for those that don't know God. It'll be so real to them. They'll be so fearful. Think of some of your loved ones, perhaps siblings, perhaps parents, perhaps children that are running to and fro, crying for the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them and hide them from the face of God. The wrath of God is coming. Do we teach the gospel with the aim to persuade? Paul is telling Timothy that an essential part of faithful gospel ministry is this investment in the next generation. Our investment in the next generation. It's not some optional add-on. In other words, when Paul tells Timothy to guard the gospel, he's not just calling Timothy to protect the integrity of the gospel from the effects of false teaching. He is also calling Timothy to fight to preserve the continuation. The continuation of the gospel against the effects of erosion over time, even beyond Timothy's time. There is an erosion taking place in our country before our very eyes of the gospel. There are already legislative pushes especially out west in states like California, to ban parts of the gospel as hate speech. It's just a small step. 
for officials to come in and say, you know what? You are not fit to be a parent. You cannot teach your children this hate-filled language. We are going to take your child from you because there's something wrong with you. You're not mentally fit to be a father and mother to this child. We will take the child and we will raise it according to the state. You might think, that's not going to happen. I'm telling you, it's a lot closer than you think. Are you able to fight to preserve the continuation of the gospel against the effects of erosion? Essential to our faithfulness is gospel ministry, is this investment in the succeeding generation of gospel ministers. Teaching your children to memorize the Bible, to be, uh, to be good soldiers and st- stewards of those who stand up and proclaim the day of the Lord. I'm telling you, if you don't teach your kids, someone else will and someone else is. It also needs to be in everything we do so that non-believers may be brought to faith in Christ. So that non-believers are able to be brought to faith in Christ. So here at Liberty, we, we try our best to sing the gospel. We do pay close attention to the words to make sure they declare truths about Jesus. Sometimes we will pick apart a song and say, you know, this song probably doesn't work. It just, it, 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 there's some false narratives here. And we, we make sure that the songs that we sing are the gospel. We preach the gospel. I've already mentioned that sermons need the gospel and that we need to check whether someone could come to faith by listening to the sermon. They need to be challenged. They need to decide, what am I going to do with this? It's been plainly stated, I must be born again. It's been plainly stated, the wrath of God is coming. It's been plainly stated that Christ died for the reconciliation of all mankind. What am I going to do with this? The gospel needs to be preached in every sermon. Are people encouraged to talk about the sermon after the service is over with? I hope folks do. I hope you do. At family gatherings, we should be encouraged to to say something like this. Okay, everyone, I want to hear one thing that was encouraging, encouraging to you about the sermon today and start up a discussion. It doesn't have to be hour long. It just needs to be important for your kids, for your grandkids, for those around the table. This is important. We're going to talk about this for a minute. What was encouraging to you? What did you get out of the message today? What challenged you? What brought a oh my response in part that's what a culture of evangelism looks like and we need it more we we need to have folks talking about the gospel talking about the message see if we really believe god's purpose for my existence to preach the gospel If you really believe that God has called me to preach the gospel, do you really believe that this message that's being given today is from heaven? Or is it something I've just made up? Do I put the time in? Do I, do I, I mean, there's countless nights I don't get home till late. Because of the message, I I want you to have this message. It's not something I just get up and and preach off the cuff. It's something I've thought about, I've read about, I've studied, I've pulled things in, I've pulled things out. Because I believe that I am the mouthpiece for God's revelation to the church. 
Now, I don't believe I'm anything any better than anybody else. I don't think that elevates me to some kind of a rock star status. Because I already know that my job as a gospel presenter is to become your slave. I'm to become your servant. That's what it says. I am your slave in the gospel. I don't want anything that's in your wallet. I don't ask for anything that's in your wallet. I become your slave. I have no rights. I take no privileges. I proclaim the gospel. That's how God set it up. So it's nothing that I take glory in. That's what Paul said too. I take no glory in it. But there is a woe pronounced unto me if I do not. And I've told you before, the one thing that really gets my attention in the Scripture is one day I'm going to stand before God and give an account of what I preach to you. So it really doesn't matter what you think about it. But it does matter what He thinks about it. Not that your opinion isn't important, but you're standing in line behind the one who is. You know, that's, I guess that's how I can say it. But I am your slave. I am your bondservant when it comes to the gospel. So we need to look for the gospel, not only in our singing and our preaching, but we also need to look for the gospel at times when we gather together with family or with friends and we study the scripture. Marsha and I will we'll talk about the scripture uh, quite frequently. And the gospel is always there. It's always there. So we want to trust Jesus when he says that all the scriptures point to him. Remember as he was walking along the road of Emmaus and the two disciples, he joined himself to them and they began to converse after Christ had uh, got crucified and he'd been buried in the tomb and now he has raised and these two disciples was leaving Jerusalem and Christ joined himself to them with a purpose to teach the gospel with the aim to persuade. And this is what he said. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Don't ever assume everyone knows the good news of Jesus Christ. Too, people, too many people are going in and out of churches without hearing it. We don't want to take that risk. We want to present the gospel in our communications. So let's look at our mission a little bit here at Liberty. Our mission is to be a ministry that promotes the sufficiency of Scripture for all areas of your life. So if you come to me, whether it's just a one-on-one or you set up a counseling session, you come to me, I'm going to give you, for the, whatever it is you're going through, I'm going to give you the sufficiency of Scriptures. It could be something terrible. It could be a situation of adultery or fornication. It could be the situation of, of you got tempted and you stole something. It, it could, whatever the situation is, I'm going to come with you, come to you, come alongside you with the sufficiency of Scriptures. Our mission is to be a ministry that promotes the sufficiency of scriptures for all the areas of life. You may be my best friend in the whole wide world. I'm not going to show you any slack when it comes to giving you the sufficiency of scriptures. I'm not going to say something like that. Well, you know, you shouldn't have done that. We'll just kind of sweep this under the rug and don't let it happen again. And by the way, let's go get a hamburger. It's not going to happen. There's going to need to be some repentance. There's going to need to be some questions answered. There's going to have to be a coming clean. That's what repentance is. You, you stop doing what you're doing and you change and you go the other way. So again, our mission is to be a ministry that promotes the sufficiency of Scriptures 
for all areas of life. Our mission is to be thoroughly equipped for God's approval to serve our community. That's my job. I'm to equip you. I equip you with the gospel. I equip you to go out and do ministry. So we want to be thoroughly equipped for God's approval to serve our community. Our mission It's to be a ministry of healing and hope for broken lives in our community. Several weeks I come across a a situation and counseled the best I could about a situation that was just terrible for all that was involved. Um, The man just got sentenced nine years in prison. Doesn't change the sufficiency of scriptures. Doesn't change the counsel that was given. There was repentance. And he turned from that activity. But it still cost him. But we gave a ministry of healing and hope for broken lives in our community. Christianity is not a, um, it, it's, it, and I, 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 I feel so uh, burdened when I hear folks talk about a service in this way. Oh, you should have been there. Oh, there was shouting, there was running the aisles, and, and oh, just, just what a fantastic service it was. What, what was the message? What, what was the preaching about? I don't know, but it was good. He hooped and he hollered and he really sweated. It was good. Made me feel good. What was it about? I, I don't remember, but it was good. And I'm thinking, are you living for the emotions of a service? Are you gathering together to be a culture of evangelism for a world that's out of control? Are you selfish in what you want out of church? Or are you trying to learn to give and to create a, a thirst and a hunger for a world that's lost? Why do you go? What's your purpose? Are you eating from the table and never preparing a meal? These are general questions. Our mission is to be a ministry of reconciliation and restoration for errant Christians. For Christians that messed up, they made a mistake, they need to repent, they need to get refocused. Reconciliation, restoration. Christians sin. Christians mess up. But we don't kick them to the curb. We don't gossip about them. We don't speak evil about them. We try to get them back to where they once were. These that are spiritual, restore that one that has went astray. So, here at Liberty, we are about progressive sanctification. That's just simply a a fancy way of saying that we want to mature in the scriptures as we go forward in our faith. We are about progressive sanctification, the process of maturing as we go forward. That's how we're structured. It's Christianity beyond belief. Now, I'm not saying it's beyond belief. I'm saying it's Christianity beyond your believing. There's there's more to it. There's a getting involved. That's who we are. Liberty is not a church solely focused on serving you. We are a church to equip you to serve others. It's not about serve us, it's about service. I know that seems kind of blunt and kind of plain, but it's true. We need more servants. So, teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade, we equip, we empower. 
we want to be open about doing the things that pleases God. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel through teaching, through preaching, through the way you live your life. The world's observing you. Are you doing the right thing consistently? Are you being loyal with your kindness even when those mistreat you and you might think, well, I don't want nothing to do with them. I'm not going to be kind to them. You know what they said? No. It doesn't matter what they said. Micah said, do the right thing. Love mercy. And that line right there in the King James means to be loyal with your kindness. That's what it means. So you do the right thing, you be loyal with your kindness, and you walk humbly. If you can do those things, you've got it. You've got it. As a matter of fact, you cannot do those things if you don't have God's grace. It's impossible. But if you do those things, it pleases our Heavenly Father. Do the right thing, be loyal with your kindness, and stay humble. We're going to ask you to stand. It's not easy to create a culture of evangelism, but that's what we want to do. That's what we want to do. Uh, by your heads for just a moment and kind of talk to the Lord where you're at in how central is the gospel in your life what's your world view like concerning the gospel are you able to be a soldier for the Lord and to push back against a culture that's anti-God are you able to stand up and fight for the beliefs of the gospel concerning your home, concerning your children, concerning your neighbors? How important is the gospel to you?